What's up, Point? Pastor Matt here, and welcome to Point Leftovers. I'm here in the Impact Center and uh, just responding to some of those questions that you guys texted in on Sunday. And you asked some great uh, questions on Sunday, May 31st. So I am pumped uh, now to get a chance to address some. And we're going to really take a deep dive into one question in particular, and I'm going to hit just a few uh, really quick. So first question we're going to do is Point Teaching. When Jesus cursed the tree to never bear fruit, did he lose control of his words too? Uh, the quick answer to that is no. Uh, Jesus was perfect. He's righteous. He's holy. Now you'll see him being perfect, righteous, and holy and get angry. And it doesn't mean that he's sinful in his anger, but rather when you see Jesus get angry, you see the righteous anger of God because he's able to control that anger. And one of the things he does when he curses the tree is he's just, you know, uh, making kind of a, a bigger point that, you know, um, Things that should bear fruit should bear fruit. And I think there's a bigger point uh, made to us as Christians. But did he lose control of his words? No. We see Jesus, even his anger, completely and totally in control of his words and his emotions. And so um, it's a good thing for us to learn uh, as we judge our own words. And then point teaching. What do we do if healing words of witness turn out to do harm? Uh, I think that's a great question. You know, uh, we can have the best intentions with our words and we can't control our words. Um, and we can't control how people will receive and react to our words. And so what I would say is always offer your words just with grace and with the best intentions possible. Realize that there's a law and there's things that scripture says that are going to hit people differently, even though you're saying the exact same thing. Um, and so what I would understand is the Holy Spirit's in control of how that's hitting someone's heart. And just pray that even if somebody's really struck by the law, that they'd be able to just be able to hold on to God's grace and find that forgiveness they can only find in God. If you found your words to be careless or you found them to be said and said out of love, I would say offer an apology. Um, don't ever be afraid to go back to somebody and say, you know what, uh, maybe what I said was right, but I said it in the wrong way. And so being willing to offer that um, opportunity for forgiveness for yourself that you need um, and being able to say, hey, I'm sorry. Um, so that's what I would say when it comes to words. Um, and then here's a question I want to spend the most time on because it's a theme and kind of a bigger question we see quite a bit in the church and in faith. And it says this, point teaching, if words are for healing, why are so many of God's words so full of blood and disdain and condemnation in the Old Testament? I think that is such a great question and I'm so glad uh, you asked it because it comes from a framework that we think oftentimes the Old Testament is the blood, guts, and gore, and the New Testament is the grace, or that you see this judgmental, you know, uh, almost evil God, we like to say in the Old Testament, and you see this loving, grace-filled God in the New Testament. Um, and the reality is this, um, that's not an accurate picture. You're going to see God's love and grace all throughout the Old Testament. You're going to see a lot of stuff that you don't quite understand. Um, a lot of stuff where God's judgment comes down. And a lot of times when God's judgment comes down, we like to say that that's God's wickedness and disdain and condemnation and, and how evil is God for wiping out entire nations, basically. Um, and so to really understand that, what I'd like us to do is just kind of get a whole picture of uh, how the gospel is and what the gospel's really all about. So to really understand that picture, uh, what I want to say is this. Um, I want you guys to understand, um, I want you guys to understand this. I want you to understand that uh, God is the creator of everything. You look at Genesis chapter 1, and Genesis chapter 1 uh, paints this really clear, really simple picture. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God created it. He even goes on to say it was without form, it was void, there was nothing there. And all of a sudden, God becomes the creator, which means God is the owner. Uh, and I think sometimes that's a, a better way to look at it when we think about it. Because when you own something, uh, you have the rights to determine how that thing will be used. Um, and a lot of times we don't think about the fact that this is God's world. He owns it. It's like thinking about it as like God's house. And I remember reading an article one time. And this article was about, uh, as a news article, about a guy that broke into somebody's house to rob it, right? And when in the process of breaking into that house, he uh, fell and he broke his leg. He goes back and he sues the owners of the house that he was breaking into when he broke his leg for like negligence and creating an unsafe environment, I guess, to break into. I know it's ridiculous. He won the lawsuit. And you hear that story and this is what you think. You think, what kind of ridiculous court would sue the owners of a house 
in favor of the robber who was breaking into the home to do it harm. It's a ridiculous story, but so often we look like the robber when we're talking about God in those terms. We say, who is God to manage the house and the creation he owns that way? See, the other reality we have to hold on to is this. God is a holy God, and we are imperfect people. And a lot of times we miss the fact that we're imperfect people because we compare ourselves to other imperfect people around us. And we say, well, hey, I'm not that bad. But the reality is scripture constantly tells us that God is a holy God. And when you compare God's holiness to our imperfection, what you begin to realize is it never quite measures up. And so what you have to realize in the Old Testament, especially when you see the conquest of the promised land, is what is said here in Deuteronomy. Uh, in Deuteronomy, God's preparing his people for the conquest. And this is what he says. He says to them in Deuteronomy 9, starting in verse 4, Do not say in your heart, after the Lord your God has thrust them out before you, it's because of my righteousness that the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. Whereas it's because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out before you. See, the reality is God is a holy God. And as a holy God, he can't stand the unrighteousness of people around him. And so what you have to understand is this. When God is adding judgment in the Old Testament, and when you see those words of judgment, it's because God doesn't compare it to the other wicked people around him. He compares it to his holiness. Now, we talked a lot on Sunday, and I want to bring this point up again. You know, a lot of times we shy away from understanding the judgment and the wrath of God. And what we need to understand is that faith is oftentimes like a pendulum. And the more you understand the judgment and the wrath of God, the more you will actually begin to see on the other side of it that picture of grace that God has. Because here's how the pendulum works. The farther you pull it back in one direction, the farther it will move in the other. And so when you think about faith, the more you understand the holiness of God and the judgment of God and, and the wrath that we deserve in God, the more you'll be able to understand the grace and the great cost God paid to bring you grace and forgiveness when you deserved judgment and wrath. You know, I think about another set of words in the Old Testament, and it's words that come in uh, the book of Isaiah. And the prophet Isaiah, he says this, and the prophet Isaiah says this uh, in chapter 53. And in 53, you hear this section of scripture that's called the suffering servant. You oftentimes, you read it uh, around the time of Easter. And the suffering servant is a picture of Jesus coming into the world and what Jesus will do for his people. And in the suffering servant picture, this is what God says. For he grew up before him like a young man planted. And then you skip down, skip down to verse 3. Chapter 53 of Isaiah, verse 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. You go on, it says... And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes, meaning the wounds, we are healed. See, the reality is you see a picture of God's judgment in the Old Testament. But when you see that picture of God's judgment, understand that's the very same judgment and that's the very same wrath that he poured out on his son, Jesus, so that we could find grace. See, the reality is this is God's world and we deserve judgment and wrath for the way we've destroyed it, the way we've broken it, and the way we've harmed the people around us for the sin in our life. And yet where we deserve wrath and judgment, God put that wrath and judgment on his son, Jesus, to bring us grace and peace. See, that's the picture we need to see. When you hear the words of judgment in the Old Testament, realize they're followed by words of grace that God gives to bring us healing. It's through hearing the judgment of a holy God that we're actually able to hear the healing words of a holy God in the gospel. Words that say, you are forgiven through the death and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hey guys, I want to thank you for texting in questions on a Sunday. Keep coming out, keep texting in those questions because that's how we grow in our faith. When we lean into those questions and allow God to meet us, even in the most difficult questions. Looking forward to seeing you guys on Sunday at the Regal Cinema in Westtown Mall, 9.30 and 10.45 a.m. right here at the Westtown Mall Regal Cinema.